Chapter 7 Witches Meet He might be recklessly endangering all of them, Ross knew. But if Ash was immured somewhere in that rock pile over their heads, then the risk of trusting Lokith would be worth it. However, because Ross was chancing his own neck did not mean that Karara need be drawn into immediate peril too. With the dolphins at her command and the supplies, scanty as those were, she would have a good chance to hide here safely. Holding out for what? She asked quietly after Ross elaborated on this subject, thus bringing him to silence. Because her question was just. With the gate gone, the Terrans were committed to this time. Just as they had earlier been committed to Hawaika when on their home world they had entered the spaceship for the takeoff. There was no escape from the past, which had become their present. The Foana, she continued, these wreckers, the sea people, all at odds with one another. Do we join any, then their quarrels must also become ours. Tawa nosed the ledge behind the girl, squeaked a demand for attention. Karara looked around at Lokith. Her look was as searching as the one the native had earlier turned on her and Ross. He, the girl nodded at the Hawaiian, wishes to know if you trust him. And he says to tell you this. Because the Shades chose to inflict upon him a twisted leg he is not one with those of the castle, but to them a broken, useless thing. Ross. I gather he thinks we have powers like the Foana, and that we may be supernatural. But because we did not kill him out of hand and have fed him, he considers himself bound to us. Ritual of bread and salt, could be. Though it might be folly to match alien customs to Terran, Ross thought of that very ancient pact on his own world. Eat a man's food, become his friend, or at least declare a truce between you. Stiff taboos and codes of behavior marked nations on Terra, especially warrior societies, and the same might be true here. Ask him, Ross told Karara, what is the rule for food and drink between friends or enemies? The more he could learn of such customs the better protection he might be able to weave for them. Long moments for the relay of that message, and then Lokith spoke into the micro-disc of the analyzer, slowly, with pauses, as if trying to make sure Ross understood every word. To give bread into the hands of one you have taken in battle, makes him your man, not as a slave to labor, but as one who draws sword at your bidding. When I took your bread I accepted you as cup lord. Between such there is no betrayal, for how may a man betray his lord? I, Lokith, am now a sword in your hands, a man in your service. And to me this is doubly good, for as a useless one I have never had a lord, nor one to swear to. Also, with this sea maid and her followers to listen to thoughts, how could any man speak with a double tongue were he one who consorted with the shadow and wore the cloak of evil? He's right, Karara added. His mind is open. He couldn't hide his thoughts from Tawa and Tino Rao even if he wished. All right, I'll accept that. Ross glanced about the ledge. They had piled the containers at the far end. For Karara to move might be safe. He said so. Move where? She asked flatly. Those men from the castle are still hunting drift out there. I don't think anyone knows of this cave. Ross nodded to Lokith. He did, didn't he? I wouldn't want you trapped here. And I don't want to lose those supplies. What is in those containers may be what saves us all. We can sink those over by the wall, weight them down in a net. Then, if we have to move, they will be ready. Do not worry, that is my department. She smiled at him with a slightly mocking lift of lips. Ross subsided, though he was irritated because she was right. The management of the dolphin team and sea matters were her department. And while he resented her reminder of that point he could not deny the justice of her retort. In spite of his crippled leg, Lokith displayed an agility which surprised Ross. Freed from his ankle bonds, he beckoned the Terran back to the very niche where he had hidden to watch Karara. 
Up he swung into that and in a second had vanished from sight. Ross followed, to discover it was not a niche after all but the opening of a crevice, leading upward as a vent. And it had been used before as a passage. There was no light, but the native guided Ross's hands to the hollow climbing holds cut into the stone. Then Lokith pushed past and went up the crude ladder into the dark. It was difficult to judge either time or distance in this black tube. Ross counted the holds for some check. His agent training made one part of his mind sharply aware of such things. The need for memorizing a passage which led into the enemy's territory was apparent. What the purpose of this slit had originally been he did not know, but strongholds on Terra had had their hidden ways in and out for use in times of siege, and he was beginning to believe that these aliens had much in common with his own kind. He had reached twenty in his counting and his senses, alerted by training and instinct, told him there was an opening not too far above. But the darkness remained so thick it fell in tangible folds about his sweating body. Ross almost cried out as fingers clamped about his wrist when he reached for a new hold. Then urged by that grasp, he was up and out, sprawling into a vertical passage. Far ahead was a gray of faint light. Ross choked and then sneezed as dust puffed up from between his scrabbling hands. The hold which had been on his wrist shifted to his shoulder, and with a surprising strength Lokith hauled the Terran to his feet. The passage in which they stood was a slit extending in height well above their heads, but narrow, not much wider than Ross's shoulders. Whether it was a natural fault or had been cut he could not tell. Lokith was ahead again, his rocking limp making the outline of his body a jerky up and down shadow. Again his speed and agility amazed the Terran. Lokith might be lame, but he had learned to adapt to his handicap very well. The light increased and Ross marked slits in the walls to his right, no wider than the breadth of his two fingers. He peered out of one and was looking into empty air while below he heard the murmur of the sea. This way must run in the cliff face above the beach. A click of impatient whisper drew him on to join Lokith. Here was a flight of stairs, narrow of tread and very steep. Lokith turned back and sighed against these to climb. His outspread hand flattened on the stone as if it possessed adhesive qualities to steady him. For the first time his twisted leg was a disadvantage. Ross counted again. Ten, fifteen of those steps, bringing them once more into darkness. Then they emerged from a well-like opening into a circular room. A sudden and dazzling flare of light made the Terran shade his eyes. Lokith set a pallid but glowing cone on a wall shelf, and the Terran discovered that the burst of light was only relative to the dark of the passage. Indeed it was very weak illumination. The Hawaiian braced his body against the far wall. The strain of his effort, whatever its purpose, was easy to read in the contorted line of his shoulders. Then the wall slid under Lokith's urging, a slow move as if the weight of the slab he strove to handle was almost too great for his slender arms, or else the need for caution was intensified here. They now fronted a narrow opening, and the light of the cone shone only a few feet into the space. Lokith beckoned to Ross and they went on. Here the left wall was cut in many places emitting patches of light in a way which bore no resemblance to conventional windows. It was like walking behind a pierced screen which followed no logical pattern in the cutaway portions. Ross gazed out and gasped. He was standing above the center core of the castle, and the life below and beyond drew his attention. He had seen drawings reproducing the life of a feudal castle. This resembled them and yet, as Ross studied the scene closer, the differences between the Terran past and this became more distinct. In the first place there were those animals, or were they animals? Being hooked up to a cart. They had six limbs, walking on four, holding the remaining two folded under their necks. 
Their harness consisted of a network fitted over their shoulders, anchored to the folded limbs. Their grotesque heads, bobbing and weaving on lengthy necks, their bodies, were sleekly scaled. Ross was startled by a resemblance he traced to the sea dragon he had met in the future of this world. But the creatures were subject to the men harnessing them. And the activity in other respects. Ross had to fight a wayward and fascinated interest in all he could see. Force himself to concentrate on learning what might be pertinent to his own mission. But Lokith did not allow him to watch for long. Instead, his hand on the Terran's arm urged the other down the gallery behind the screen and once more into the bulk of the fortress. Another narrow way ran through the thickness of the walls. Then a patch of light, not that of outer day, but a reddish gleam from an opening waist high. There Lokith went awkwardly to his good knee, motioning Ross to follow his example. What lay below was a hall furnished with a barbaric rawness of color and glitter. There were long strips of brightly hued woven stuff on the walls, touched here and there with sparkling glints which were jewel-like. And set at intervals among the hangings were oval objects perhaps Ross's height on which were designs and patterns picked out in paint and metal. Maybe the stylized representation of native plants and animals. The whole gave an impression of clashing color, just as the garments of those gathered there were garish in turn. There were three Hawaikans on the two-step dais. All wore robes fitting tightly to the upper portion of their bodies, girded to their waists with elaborate belts, then falling in long points to floor level, the points being finished off with tassels. Their heads were covered with tight caps which were a latticework of decorated strips, glittering as they moved. And the mixture of colors in their apparel was such as to offend Terran eyes with their harsh clash of shade against shade. Drawn up below the dais were two rows of guards. But the reason for the assembly baffled Ross, since he could not understand the clicking speech. There came a hollow echoing sound as from a gong. The three on the dais straightened, turned their attention to the other end of the hall. Ross did not need Lokith's gesture to know that something of importance was about to begin. Down the hall was a somber note in the splash of clashing color. The Terran recognized the gray-blue robe of the Foana. There were three of the robed ones this time, one slightly in advance of the other two. They came at a gliding pace as if they swept along above that paved flooring, not by planting feet upon it. As they halted below the dais, the men there rose. Ross could read their reluctance to make that concession in the slowness of their movements. They were plainly being compelled to render deference when they longed to refuse it. Then the middle one of the castle lords spoke first. Zahor. Lokith breathed in Ross's ear, his pointed finger indicating the speaker. Ross longed vainly for the ability to ask questions, a chance to know what was in progress. That the meeting of the two Hawaiian factions was important he did not doubt. There was an interval of silence after the castle lord finished speaking. To the Terran this spun on and on and he sensed the mounting tension. This must be a showdown, perhaps even a declaration of open hostilities between Wreckers and the older race. Or perhaps the pause was a subtle weapon of the Foana, used to throw a less sophisticated enemy off balance, as a judo fighter might use an opponent's attack as part of his own defense. When the Foana did make answer, it came in the sing-song of chanted words. Ross felt Lokith shiver, felt the crawl of chill along his own spine. The words, if those were words and not just sounds intended to play upon the mind and emotions of a listener, cut into one. Ross wanted to close his ears, thrust his fingers into them to drown out that sound, yet he did not have the power to raise his hands. It seemed to him that the men on the dais were swaying now as if the chant were a rope leashed about them, pulling them back and forth. There was a clatter. One of the guards had fallen to the floor and lay there, rolling, his hands to his head. A shout from the dais. 
The chanting reached a note so high that Ross felt the torment in his ears. Below, the lines of guards had broken. A party of them were heading for the end of the hall, making a wide detour around the foana. Lokith gave a small choked cry. His fingers tightened on Ross's forearm with painful intensity as he whispered. What was about to happen meant something important. To Lokith or to him. Ash? Was this concerned with Ash? Ross crowded against the opening, tried to see the direction in which the guards had disappeared. The wait made him doubly impatient. One of the men on the dais had dropped on the bench there, his head forward on his hands, his shoulders quivering. But the one Lokith had identified as Zahor still fronted the Foana spokesman, and Ross gave tribute to the strength of will which kept him there. They were returning, the guards, and herded between their lines three men. Two were Hawaikans, their bare dark bodies easily identifiable. But the third, Ash. Ross almost shouted his name aloud. The Terran stumbled along and there was a bandage above his knee. He had been stripped to his swimming trunks, all his equipment taken from him. There was a dark bruise on his left temple, the angry wheel of a lash mark on neck and shoulder. Ross's hands clenched. Never in his life had he so desperately wanted a weapon as he did at that moment. To spray the company below with a machine gun would have given him great satisfaction. But he had nothing but the knife in his belt and he was as cut off from ash as if they were in separate cells of some prison. The caution which had been one of his inborn gifts and which had been fostered by his training, clamped down on his first wild desire for action. There was not the slightest chance of his doing Ash any good at the present. But he had this much. He knew that Gordon was alive and that he was in the alien's hands. Faced by those facts Ross could plan his own moves. The Foana chant began again, and the three prisoners moved. The two Hawaikans turned, set themselves on either side of Ash, and gave him support. Their actions had a mechanical quality as if they were directed by a will beyond their own. Ash gazed about him at the wreckers and the robed figures. His awareness of them both suggested to Ross that if the natives had come under the control of the Foana, the Terran resisted their influence. But Ash did not try to escape the assistance of his two fellow prisoners, and he limped with their aid back down the hall, following the Foana. Ross deduced that the captives had been transferred from the lord of the castle to the Foana. Which meant Ash was on his way to another destination. The Terran was on his feet and headed back, intent on returning to the sea cave and starting out after Ash as soon as he could. You have found Gordon. Karara read his news from his face. The wreckers had him prisoner. What will they do with him? The girl demanded of Lokith. His answer came roundabout as usual as the native squatted by the analyzer and clicked his answer into it. They have claimed the wreck survivors for tribute. Your companion will be witch's meat. Witch's meat? Repeated Ross, uncomprehending. Then Karara drew a gagged breath which was a gasp of horror. Sacrifice. Ross, he must mean they are going to use Gordon for a sacrifice. Ross stiffened and then whirled to catch Lokith by the shoulders. The inability to question the native directly was an added disaster now. Where are they taking him? Where? He began that fiercely, and then forced control on himself. Karara's eyes were half-closed, her head back. She was manifestly aiming that inquiry at the dolphins, to be translated to Lokith. Symbols burned on the analyzer screen. The Foana had their own fortress. It can be entered best by sea. There is a boat. I can show you, for it is my own secret. Tell him. Yes, as soon as we can. Ross broke out. The old feeling that time was all-important worried at him. Witches meet. Witches meet. The words were sharp as a lash.